Hello, everybody. Let's do a quick sound check. Can you hear me? And let's see if we can hear our wonderful guests. Well, our wonderful guest and my fellow host. Um, to my left, Assistant Director Zay Olson. Say hey hi, guys. Zay. So How is everyone today? Cool. <laughs> <laughs> and to my right, uh, we are honored to have Zeke Nelson coming to us from far across the pond. Hello, people. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, <laughs> depending on which part of the world you're in. We'll do a replay, so it'll definitely be, uh, be out there. Um, <laughs> All right. It is great to meet you. We have some little uh, housekeeping to do in the beginning, but this is a show where people can come and uh, talk about geeky things like gaming and trivia, and we talk about World Builders, which is a nonprofit that uh, raises money for good causes, uh, geek-focused, and just trying to make the world a better place. And um, sorry, my cat has decided that my paper on this corner is very yummy right now. Um the uh, um, today we're especially happy to have Zeke Nelson here. Um, uh, Zeke, you are in the process of making the second volume of a comic called Nani. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So Nani is my second uh, graphic novel. Uh, put up the first volume just about a year ago, and uh, we we recently ran a Kickstarter to fund the production of the second volume. We are, we are really excited to get into showing some of the artwork from that and talking more about that. Um, but first, say, you want to take us into the trivia? Uh, absolutely. Uh, our old trivia question, guys, hopefully some of you got this right. Um, in the episode End of the World, the doctor shows up to the party with no gift. What gift does he give? Um, you, uh, some of you did message us, and of course, you can always message us in our questions um, on all of our platform DMs. And the answer was air from his lungs. Yes, and actually, I have the this answer right there. <laughs> Boy, I spent a lot of time setting up a scene and then had the wrong scene showing. So, yes, he gave air from his lungs. Are you a Doctor Who fan, Siki? Oh, Honestly, not a huge deal. I've watched a few episodes here and there, uh, but I appreciate the, the, the majesty for the storytelling. Yeah. I mean, they just, I, I appreciate just the staying power. I mean, that's, that's a, that, that thing's older than I am and that's, <laughs> and still going strong. Yeah, exactly. Especially since it's more or less the same concept, um, just kind of going over and over and over again. So it's, uh, it's impressive how they managed to keep such a strong uh, and passionate fan base. Yes, incredible. Um, and as somebody pointed out in the thing, he gave air from his lungs, which is something we should not share these days. Uh, is very, <laughs> Thank very you, true. Audience, for that clarification. Yes. Well, well put, well phrased. Thank you for making it contemporary. Uh, and now we have our new question. Now, before we show the new question, let's remind everybody of the rules um, that we have... Uh, we do not answer it in the chat. We don't answer it right off the bat. Um, we direct message it through some various social media, so via Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, wherever you'd like to. And if you do get the answer uh, right or even close to right, we will enter you in a drawing for a special prize. It happens at the end of every month. You know what? It is the beginning of a new month, which means somebody got the prize for last month, and I don't know who did or what it was. So. Somebody needs to tell me about that at some point, he said vaguely off to the producer. Um, so, this week the new question is, say, read it off. The current speed record for solving a 3x3x3 three by three by three, uh, Rubik's Cube is 3.47 seconds. What is the name of the person who set that record? Yes. And uh, I, I, I have to confess another one of my geek failings. Eh? Um, I have never, never solved a Rubik's Cube. I, I got I've never solved one. I'm, I'm with you. Oh, yeah? Okay, I feel better. <laughs> some, 
<laughs> I I managed to get like a couple of sides, and then at, at, at that point I, I sort of lose patience. That's even further than me because I only I, I got to the point where I could do one side, and then I was like, I'm just gonna take off the I stickers. I hate how when you have a side done, you have to mess it up to get the other ones, and it's really discouraging. <laughs> <laughs> and yet somehow a metaphor for life. Um, <laughs> oh, no. All right, um, we also every week uh, put on a game of the week uh, that we set up. And this week, what the heck happened to my screen? Sorry. Um, thankfully, our Zoom guest can't see it, but for some reason on on uh, Twitch, I had the screen all messed up. So um, this week... I mean, he could be on Twitch. <laughs> that gets true. Well, I'm, I'm hoping he's... <laughs> no, it's Rios. Yes. He's moving us along. <laughs> you guys, um, as you know, this game will go... Um, off in the sorter, 10%. Um, this game is one, once again, somehow, that I have not played. We keep getting a lot of these bordered games coming up, and I feel like I have played so many, and not this one. Um, you're either, you and the other farmer of the valley know the rivers, um, are the lifeblood of the land. Each round, farmers can harvest and sell crops from their field if they are able, and then use the profits to build building structures or dam up one of the two rivers using lumber they acquire. This is a super interesting concept. Uh, who's played this? <laughs> I, I was just going to say this falls in that category of things that are too close to a real job for me to enjoy playing it. Um, like, you know, I have a, my, my girlfriend was a farmer, and I know how hard that is to do with the whole crops thing and stuff. And no, <laughs> I don't want to play games like that. I want to be, I want to escape. Um, but I'm sure it's a fun game. Uh, and I'm looking at it. It looks like one river's doing much better than the other, on that, according to that cover there. That is not there. Hmm. But yes, that will be on sale and everything. And now, let's get to the main... Thing we want to talk about, which is Nani. Is that I'm pronouncing that right? Nani. Nani. <laughs> yep. Okay. Um, but don't worry. It's uh, it's from a so so in Nigeria we have many different. Uh, I'm from Nigeria, by the way. If mm -hmm. people don't know this, but we have many different uh, ethnicities, and we all speak different uh, languages. So. Nani comes from the, the north of Nigeria, the, the language, one of the languages spoken there from a word called uh, Tunani. And um, so it's a very unique and distinct uh, pronunciation that I don't expect people to be able to, uh, to I, I can't even do it properly, to be honest. So <laughs> I'm going to, to do it. Gotcha. The, um... Well, thanks for the encouragement. We do like to pronounce things as right as we possibly can on here, though, especially guest names. Um, I feel like it's just a courtesy to extend. But um, yeah, thank you. That's really interesting. Uh, kind of jumping right in, I guess. Um, Gray, if you can, uh, we do have a couple uh, other images as well yeah. or that kind of show from the Kickstarter the, I have, the character. Uh, some, some of the character art to show up here. Yeah. Um, so I wanted, before we jump into Nami specifically, I would love it, uh, Ziki, if you could talk a little bit about the Kugali Anthology. Sure. So the, where, where should I even start with this? So the Kugali Anthology was something that's been cooking since I want to say uh, 2017. So w what had happened is uh, over the course of, of getting Kugali off the ground, my my co-founder uh, Tolu and I have made a lot of friends with uh, comic book creators uh, across the the um, across Africa and also the African diaspora as well. Some really talented people, and one of them sent me a message. His name is Bill Masuku from Zimbabwe, saying, "Hey, wouldn't it be really cool if Kugali did a a, a magazine or something?" And at the time, I kind of dismissed the idea because it seemed just so far outside of what I, because this was something I was just doing for fun, um, to explore uh, African uh, comics. But then it was in 2018, I believe, no, 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 in 2017 still, that we got invited to uh, the uh, Africa Rights uh, Festival in London, which is one of the biggest uh, literature festivals. And we were there to, to showcase what 
the, the comic book world um, across Africa was, was saying. And so it didn't really make sense in my mind to go there and just talk. I, I, I thought it'd be really cool if we could ha actually have something to show people. And therefore we contacted a few of the, the artists who we had made friends with um, and said, hey, why don't we put together a little uh, magazine that will be essentially a comic anthology um, of our different works to give people a taste of what the uh, comic book scene is saying across different African countries. So that was a, a sort of prototype. We call that the Kugali magazine. We did another four of those. And then eventually, this was all a sort of bootstrapped operation. And eventually we decided we needed we needed help to keep this uh, operation going. So we, we came up with the idea of like the what people now know today as the Kugali Anthology, which was our first Kickstarter campaign. We launched in February 2018, which was essentially just a, an expanded version of the Kugali magazine. Um, and I think I've given a lot of context here, so I'll just pause for now. No, that's, that's great. Um, I mean, obviously, um you know, African writers as well as African characters are completely underrepresented, um, especially in an African setting. Um, and I think Nani specifically, or Nani, is um, it's, it's really beautiful. It gives a glimpse into kind of African mythology and um, the, wor the world, is it Mara? Mara? Sorry, I also roll my R's a bit. <laughs> um, but, uh, um, you know, it kind of, it can give readers a kind of glimpse into um, this mythology, which is uh, underrepresented. Um, I really encourage you guys to, to go take a look. There uh, was a Kickstarter. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but also, it's still available. Um, Gray, could you say where you, where you bought your copy from? Uh, I bought mine from Kugali.com. Actually, uh, I was able to go in and it was very helpful. You can, um, I'm in the US, so they have a little um, thing where you can go from pounds to dollars. And I was able to get an ebook uh, within seconds <laughs> and then very nicely emailed. Um, and also, the other thing you have is a whole lot of free comics to read there on the site. I believe the first 40 pages of volume two for uh, Nani is there. Um, and it's, it's just gorgeous. Uh, I, I honestly was going through, I didn't have time, uh, as much time this morning as I, as I wanted to, to kind of go in and just, uh, look at all of the artwork in there. You're the artist and the writer, Ziki? No, no, no. I, I wish I could, I could claim credit for, for all those talents, but I, I just wrote the, the story. The, the oh, okay. his name is, uh, Jason S. He's from Zimbabwe. Ah, okay. Gotcha. That's so, actually one of my questions on here is, um, you know, I think with the, when it comes to a lot of authors who write like novels, um, you know, the, the work is kind of more dependent on their singular vision. But for you, you know, as a graphic novel writer, you have to kind of let other people help you visually bring your story to life. And there's on your Kickstarter, there's a page that kind of introduces you to an illustrator, a colorist, an inker. Um, what is that like to, to have to kind of share your vision in that way? It, it, it depends. So when I knew that I, I wanted to, to get into to comics uh, and, and I knew that the, the one talent I had was, was writing more than, than drawing, I, I did a bit of, of research and I realized that there's a, very, there's, there's a range. So you have writers like Alan Moore, who did Watchmen, Beef of Vendetta, who go into very painstaking detail. They, they almost describe each panel or each scene in the comic as, as though they were writing a, um, a novel and, and, and it paints a really vivid picture. Whereas uh, we, we've got a publisher uh, here in the UK called 2000 AD, they're most uh, known for Judge Dredd. Um, they will just put descriptions like really cool fight scene or punch. Um, and so <laughs> there's, um, so, so for me, what I, I try to do is I try and um, essentially just be open to, to, to collaboration. So in this particular um, instance, I, I, I try and, and get as much uh, feedback and, and uh, input from the, the people working on the, the project because I, I just find that the, the advantage of, of, of being more collaborative is, is 
people are able to see things uh, sometimes the way you don't see them. So I might create certain scenes and then uh, because I give the, the artists a bit of, of creative license, they might throw in a couple of things in there that, that add more more color or accentuate what I was going for, which is, is really cool. So a lot of the times it, it, it really varies across the book. There are certain scenes or panels where I have a really, really specific idea of what I want it to look like. And I'm a little bit very, a bit of a ser sergeant when I'm like, no, 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 it needs to look like this. But a lot of the time, I, I just want the artists to also enjoy themselves and express themselves and bring something to, to the table. Has there been a particular point where an artist has brought something there that you're like, oh, I didn't think of that, but that's exactly right? Like, I think the biggest example I can think of is in volume one. So the colorist, uh, Christina, she uses a lot of uh, inverted colors in, in her coloring. And it's not something that I, I've seen a lot of in, in, in comics. Um, but the way she uses it really accentuates and heightens the, the emotion uh, of, of the scenes and the intensity. And I'm just like, whoa, like, this is not exactly what I pictured, but this is even better. So that's the first example that, that comes to mind. Nice. That's so interesting. Um, I, I just, I feel like, you know, we don't have a lot of comic and graphic novel uh, people on here. Most of, a, a lot of our audience, um, you know, gets to see a lot of the author base. So it's, it's pretty unique to get to kind of hear the team aspect of this world building that you guys go through. Um, kind of going back I'm a little curious, going back to the African mythology, you know, as you mentioned, you're, you're from Nigeria. Uh, was that um, part, that cultural um, part of your uh, series, was that something that you kind of grew up with or was it something you had to, you know, research a bit about? A little bit of both. So I, I lived in Nigeria until I was about 15 years old before I moved to, to England. And whilst I was there, I did learn a little bit about... So the part of Nigeria I'm from is, is, is part of the Yoruba part of, of Nigeria, which is one of the uh, ethnic groups there. So I learned uh, quite a bit about uh, Yoruba mythology and, 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 and the traditional spiritual beliefs. So that seed was planted in my head, but it wasn't something I was particularly curious about, to, to be perfectly honest. It was only when I left Nigeria and had spent probably close to five to six years in the UK that I started to, to kind of look back towards my, my, my culture, particularly when I knew that I, I wanted to become a, a writer. I've always been a massive uh, fantasy head. I, I love the, the fantasy genre, sci-fi sci -fi too. And um, I think it was when I went, I, I, so we had the very first Comic Con in Lagos in 2012. And I went back to Lagos uh, for that. And I had seen other people take our local uh, myths and folklore and come up with, with comic book ideas. And that was really when the idea or, or the concept really resonated with me that A, this was possible, but also B, that it, it was really, really cool because it's bringing something completely new to the table. And so after I had seen all of this, it inspired me to do a real deep dive into various aspects of of uh, well, I started off with West African uh, mythology, and this uh, soon enough started to spread uh, to other parts of the the continent. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, for for those people that are like art history buffs, I know you mentioned West Africa. Are there any other particulars culturally that you can kind of name that kind of appear in the world building? Oh, you mean for for Nani? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So the uh, my so in in Nani uh, the the a quick overview of the story, by the way, uh, is that it's about two sisters who find themselves transported to a uh, a magical world that that's essentially inspired by different uh, African myths and, and legends. Um, it might help to anchor it to the sort of isekai uh, genre for those people who like uh, anime or, or manga, but. Part of the, and then in this world, there are many different groups, uh, tribes or, or clans um, that are inspired by uh, different groups from uh, African mythology or um, African uh, uh, culture. So for example, the, the, <coughs> the group that, that essentially takes the role of villain in the first novel, they're called uh, Kura's 
which are essentially uh, where hyenas. Now, where hyenas show up in, in African, in both um, West African uh, mythology, um, if, if I remember off the top of my head, somewhere around the Senegal, Senegalese area. So uh, I'm thinking Wolof uh, culture, uh, but also in, in East Africa as well. Um, and and Kuras are essentially were hyenas. So were hyenas are, are very popular. Shapeshifters actually are, are generally tend to be really popular in, in, um, in um, across different aspects of uh, African mythology. Then the uh, Mayaki warriors uh, are inspired by both the um, Ashanti uh, warriors from uh, from from Ghana, which was a sort of like a all like a female group of warriors, and then also. Uh, Fulani warriors from the north of, of Nigeria as well. Wow. The um, you you mentioned the, the female warriors um, and it, was there what, was there something particularly unique about writing from the female perspective, um, or did you just say, well, these characters are going to be female for no particular reason? <laughs> so. The, the thing is, the actual real inspiration behind Nani is a story I heard uh, that happened to a, a friend of mine. Essentially, because um, I, I wouldn't give away too many spoilers, but this friend of mine, she had uh, flown into, so I think she was, she was studying in the UK. She flew back to Lagos for, um, for, for, for a vacation. And on her way back home from the airport, a group of uh, armed men tried to, to to kidnap her, and she literally had to jump off a bridge into the into the uh, sea river uh, lagoon um, to escape them. Because in her head, anyway, she just thought that like if I go with these men, um, I'm probably never going to see my family again. So I'll take my chances with with the lagoon. And I don't know why, but I mean, this is generally how I tend to come up with ideas anyways. I hear anecdotes from real life and my creative juices start to flow. But I thought to myself, what would happen if when she jumped into the, into the, the water, she found herself in a new world? And because the person who the story was centered on was, was a woman, it made sense to just like, I mean, why, why change the gender at this point? Because she's the inspiration now for the story. But then I edited it quite a bit because then I threw in um, a sister and actually, now that I think about it, um, another thing I wanted to explore with Nani is, um, you know, I think bromance is a very uh, popular kind of style of storytelling, something that we really enjoy. And there are a lot of iconic bromances, but I was just curious to, I, I don't even know what the term would be in, in a sort of female context, but I was just curious to explore that same sort of dynamic, but with two sisters. That's the main reason why I added the, the sister, not just the, the solitary character. Oh, it sounds fantastic. I, I, I'm going to especially like it. So I, I have four daughters. Um, so, you know, any, uh, and, and I raised them on like, you know, Xena and Buffy and, you know, you go on from there. Um, so any, any kick-ass female characters I'm going to uh, uh, enjoy um, both for myself and to pass on to them. And frankly, to get my grandsons to read too, because that, that's going to be awesome. Um <laughs> Yeah, the uh, I'm just going to make sure I don't miss any of these uh, questions. Um, you had mentioned uh, in your uh, in your video for your Kickstarter. Well, I, I we're also going to talk about the Kickstarter too. Uh, but you had mentioned in, in the video for the Kickstarter um, that if people liked, uh, if if they saw Black Panther and liked it, that they would enjoy this kind of thing. Um, and it's kind of funny when. When we were uh, first talking about having you on, my first thought was, I need to make sure I don't just say Black Panther because he's probably you know had that comparison made so many times. But since you brought it up, I can ask. I mean, do you think that that Black Panther was a, a good representation, or do you think it was you know how would you have done it differently if you could have? Okay, uh, so. I'll, I'll answer the question in two parts. So the reason why I made the, the Black Panther reference is just primarily because I know that the Kickstarter audience uh, is primarily a, a Western audience. You know, we're looking at, mm -hmm. um, I think the most people who use Kickstarter are Americans, Germans, and, and British people. And so Black Panther just made sense as a, as a, as a reference point because you want to make things um, easy for people. 
Um, and as far as what I think about uh, Black Panther, it, it, it depends because we're, there are like several comic book runs, some of which I think are really, really cool. And, mm -hmm. and to be honest, um, the Black Panther character was one of the characters that planted uh, the seeds for what I would do uh, eventually, just because uh, I, I guess I, I went through a personal like journey of, of transformation where um, initially, I, I, I sort of gravitated towards uh, Western culture in terms of the things that I preferred. Um, and then I saw uh, some Black Panther comics, and here I saw like an African character who was really cool, really uh, competent, um, and that, that, that meant a lot. As far as the movie is concerned, um, there are things I like about the film, and there are things that I think could have been done better. Um, generally speaking, I like the world building of, of Wakanda. I thought it was really cool um, the way they they sort of turned that uh, for for the big screens. Um, some of the the really cool aspects, like they they sew vibranium into their their, their clothing, and and then they have the vibranium thing in their their teeth. Those things are really really accurate as far as because we're kind of set in East Africa, so they're they're really accurate in terms of what um, those types of people would be willing to do. I also love the the the, the, the women. You know, we're, we're talking about women as well. I love the the women in, in Black Panther. You know, a lot of them reminded me of like how my my sisters or my aunties would would behave. So so I like that. Um, I think the only thing that I, I think the, the movie had room for improvement is just that it tried to create a, a composite in the sense that you have this nation in, in, uh, in, West, in, in Eastern Africa that speak a Southern African language. Uh, one of the tribes um, speaks with a Nigerian vernacular. Um, another tribe uh, speaks with a sort of Ethiopian vernacular. And... Um, I understand why they were trying to do it in the sense that they wanted to make something for, for everyone. But I also, uh, there's something I'm really careful of with, with Kugali is being careful not to try and shoehorn the entirety of Africa into one sort of uh, space, which is why even when I talk about things like Nani, I'm very specific about the different bits of, of, of the culture that um, I, I, I draw inspiration from. So that's a, that's a long answer, but... <laughs> well, I, I think it's... Yeah, that is wonderful. It it leaves so much more room for other stories to be told and more more characters to to come out. Um, I never I never quite understood that <laughs> that narrowing of the vision. That's um, the uh, uh, I, shoot. I had a different question up, and then the the chats went up, and I was like, oh no, distracted squirrel. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, can you uh, you want you you mentioned the Kickstarter. And uh, we, you and I were talking uh, before the show a little bit about how I, I went and found the Kickstarter and watched the video and then tried to click on, I'm going to, I'm definitely going to back this and I wasn't able to do it. You said it's going to, more things are going to come up, come out? Yeah, sure. So the, the, the Kickstarter concluded last week, uh, I'm going to say um, Thursday. We did really well, by the way. We uh, got to nearly 500% of, of our goal. So really encouraging. And what we're going to do at the moment, <clears throat> because we don't plan on um, on doing fulfillment until probably towards the end of the year, beginning of, of next year. So we're going to give uh, people an opportunity, if, they, if they're interested in, in, in picking up some of the rewards, to, to do that. We'll be posting uh, a, a sort of pre-order link on the Kickstarter page at the beginning of next week. So that'll be like Monday, the I want to say the 13th. Um, and oh no 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 um, it'll be Monday the twelfth and so people will be able to to get access some of the the Kickstarter pledges some of the um, some of them have already gone but whatever is left will people will be able to access that um, or if you know if you can't wait and you want to get Volume One straight away you can literally just go to Kugali.com um, and Volume One is also there as well. Now unfortunately they don't also give you an extra hour and a half of time to sit and enjoy it. Uh, which is what I'm going to need. I was looking at it going, I really want to dig into this, but work and everything else. Um, do you want to uh, talk a little bit about your team? Uh, who else is working with you and worked with you on this? You, men you mentioned the yes. artist, but... Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so, so Nani specifically, the, the, the writer is myself, uh, and then the uh, editor, her name is Nyasha 
Muga Bazi from uh, Zimbabwe. In fact, actually, there's, there's, a, there's a bit of a Zimbabwe connection. The Inca, Bill Masuku, is a, a comic book creator from Zimbabwe as well. And uh, Jason S as well, the, the, the main artist, is uh, from uh, Zimbabwe too. Then uh, for volume one, the, the main colorist was uh, Christina Alvarez. She's actually from uh, Venezuela. Uh, but her, we, we just love her, her use of, um, of, of colors and it really worked well with, with the, the, the project. Um, unfortunately, she wasn't able to do um, volume two. So at the moment, Jason is doing most of the colors for, for volume two, but we're hoping to bring on um, another uh, artist from, from Nigeria. I don't, I don't want to say her name yet um, in case she, uh, she doesn't, um, um, it doesn't work out, but we're really close to agreeing something with her. And, uh, and that's the creative team behind Nani. Uh, one of my co-founders, Hamid Ibrahim from Uganda, he helped a bit with the, the art direction because he's a professional uh, VFX artist and artist um, overall. And he tends to do all things art direction related anyway. Um, so he's helped specifically with uh, volume two as well. Wow. So I love- you find that like when you go from volume one to volume two, now you have a different colorist. And I mean, graphic, it, you know, it's comic, it's graphic, it's very visual. Do you find that it kind of changes the tone or do you feel like it, you can still keep a relative consistency from one volume to the next? I think it, it definitely is a little bit different in the sense that particularly because of how unique the the original colorist is it's a bit of a challenge to recreate um some of the really cool things that she did but it's the the best analogy i can think of is is um is, you know it's like cuisine where i don't know uh you know ch- chinese food is really different to, to to mexican food but they all both have their unique um flavors that are both really cool um, and so it's about, and as a writer, I tend to just think about the, the, the creative team behind the project and try and design it in a way that, that works to the strengths of, of the team that's, that's on board. Um, so it's, it's different, but it's, it's cool in its own new and, and new, unique way as well. Yeah, Nate uh, Tyler, who is a fantasy artist, um, is in the is in the chat. Great, I was going to mention this. Says that you sound like a really great uh, writer to work with, as far as letting artists represent um, your vision. Which, I mean, we love Nate Taylor, so I feel like that's a huge compliment. <laughs> But, uh, Thank you. I, I really appreciate that, and, and you know, just to 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 stress on that point again, for me, the whole advantage of of, of creating a, a graphic novel um, and collaborating is to try and bring the best out of everybody um, taking part. You know, um, if you're too much of a, a drill sergeant, I, I guess it, it can work if, if that's what you're 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 going for. But I, I definitely enjoy. Uh, because I want everyone to have fun at the end of the day. Like this is this is fun to me, you know. Even though it's what I do um, for a living, but I want everyone to, to have fun. And the best way, in my opinion, to do that is to give them an opportunity to to express themselves. Yeah, that that's wonderful. And again, um, I just want to stress for our audience, um, please check out Kugali.com because not only is Nani a, a work in of itself that's amazing and you know, represents African culture, but I just really love that you kind of have, you know, on your your own, a, a little bit of a separate mission to, to you know, uh, kind of highlight these other uh, African uh, artists and um, writers. And if you guys go there, you know, you'll get a plethora of just, again, I hate that word. I, I hate reusing words too much, but underrepresented artists and, and writers who, who all have their stories. And I, I'm really appreciative that you don't want to like shoehorn, <laughs> you know, Africa is not, <laughs> it's not was the state of Wisconsin. You know, it's, there's lots of perspective. It's kind of like when we say Native American, you know, that doesn't really represent all of the separate tribes that make up Native peoples. Um, and in the same way, you know, it's a big continent with uh, tons of separate histories. Um, so please check that out. We, uh, if you don't mind going back to Nani, and you mentioned that, um, uh, you know, you kind of wanted to see this like sisterhood version of like the bromance. Um, I understand that it's a little bit different than perhaps writing like a novel um, when it comes to character writing, but 
do you, you know, being um, a man and having kind of like talking about this thing through this female perspective, do you have any like hangups or like specifics or do you just kind of, you know, like just kind of use your own perspective and let it just translate through the characters? Mm, I, th th that's an interesting question. I, I don't know if there's anything um, I was particularly hesitant to explore uh, being um, a, a man. I think part of part of actually one of the things that makes me really want to explore the, the theme of uh, sisterhood is that I have uh, two uh, older sisters who are really close and their, 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 their relationship is just it's just you know fascinating to explore because I, I I kind of had a cousin who was close to me in age who was like a brother to me and and just noticing what like how my cousin and I interacted compared to my sister and I, um sorry my sisters uh, versus the two of us um and and furthermore my because my editor is, is is a woman I I kind of relied on her to just make sure that there wasn't anything that I, that um because there are just certain things you weren't um uh, aware of that uh that or you you might not be aware of um i i always try and do my my homework the best analogy i can i can think of is um my mom was was ill for for a little bit uh when we were growing up and so when my sisters you know hit uh puberty and, and they uh, my eldest sister hit puberty and she started to to get uh uh, periods, uh, my dad had to kind of like, it was not something that my dad even thought about or even like really occurred to him. And so those are like the things that I try to to sort of navigate is what is like, what would it be like in the day of, let's say, Menau or Lamin in the normal world and what would go through their head and what would be their thought pattern? Um, and so it took a little bit of time for me to really try and do a deep dive to figure that out. But how I tr tr just try and navigate that is, again, talk to talk to my sisters, talk to my editor, uh, and, and then just observe, you know, observe the women um, around me. So it was, it's definitely not as easy as, as writing a male character because I can just think of myself and put myself in that um, situation. But I think if you're writing any character that is different to you, whether the dimension is, is gender, race, um, nationality, inevitably they're going to be things that you will have to do to kind of step outside of yourself. So to me, this is just another dimension that, um, that, that, um, that I'm adding to, to the different types of characters that I'm exploring. Yeah, uh, if, uh, that actually makes me think of another question I had is while I was looking at, um, at uh, uh, sorry, while I was looking at Nani when I first found the Kickstarter, um, I saw that there were similar stories and they were written by um, white men. And I'm just, I'm curious, do you think that that's, um, it's still uh, good in the sense that they're getting out um, a story that's from the African um, perspective, you know, like stories of people in Africa with African mythology, even though it's, uh, you know, written as an African, but it's coming from the perspective like, a white man that's writing it i guess white person i don't i don't know if it was a man or not um now that i think of it but um or do you think that it's kind of um like might be a misrepresentation it really depends so i think part of what makes the or at least certain members of the audience somewhat uh dubious and skeptical is if you Let's just say, for example, I don't know what the statistics are, but if you say 100 books are published a year and every single one of those 100 books, the, the author of, of that book is, is, is white or is, is male, then people start to get a little bit um, suspicious. So I think it's important to be mindful of, of just the, the, that element of the equation. But to me, I, I sort of rank... I have my own hierarchy in, in terms of okay. Do I feel like um, this story is like represents me? You know, one example I can think of is is the Beast of No Nations uh, film, which is directed by uh, Kari Fukunaga, who is I guess American Japanese. And there is a, there is a, particularly like the beginning part of the film where they're showing like life in, in the village. The way there's a scene in a school where a teacher is teaching a group of students, and that's literally what like my schoolroom you know like looked like. 
And that, that, that to me is like the coolest part, right? Is, is seeing that and being able to see myself in it. Um, and so for those reasons, it didn't matter that it was, it was uh, Kari Fukunaga directing the film. However, um, I think the problem starts to come if every single film like that is, is directed by a, a, a Kari Fukunaga, especially if there are talented um, mm-hmm. African uh, or, or, or black um, or, or you know, any other like, group of, of directors that are waiting in the ranks, desperate to tell these stories. This is when I think people get a, a little bit annoyed. Right. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. And that's a, a great answer to that question. I've, I've just been kind of curious. And, you know, I mean, there are also of every <coughs> genre from fantasy to sci fi, as well as every type subtype, wh- whether it's comic or novels, um, kind of has its own, I think, hang ups to that. Um, but of course, you know, as you mentioned in Nami um, uh, or on the Kickstarter page, we definitely see where fantasy you know it's it's generally this um not even just white but also this kind of shoehorned i mean that's probably i'm using that word because uh, i heard it earlier but um it's kind of also just this like medieval representation and oh, yeah. it's, it's like you know you kind of get this yeah. one linear not only white but like one era of of a white and it's just kind of a weird um weird that every kind of fantasy novel we think could almost take place in the same setting um (laughs) yeah the the best the best fantasy book that i read all of last year was um a book called rage of dragons by evan winter Mm -hmm. now we get to have him actually come on next month um and the reason I loved it so much was because, yeah, you have, you know, Rage of Dragons. Obviously, there's dragons in it. But it was entirely within an Egyptian-based uh, mythology kind of thing. And um, now I don't, I don't know Egyptian mythology, so I have no idea how accurate it is. But it was different, and it was interesting, and it was like, it was fresh. And I am like, you know, I, I, I get burned out pretty easily on epic fantasies. Um, and, and because they all seem to be, oh, look, it's a chosen one who didn't know they were chosen and was raised on a farm and, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, it just gets really tiring. And then, then even then when they change it around, sometimes like, oh, look, they're trying to change around the same story. It's still the same story. So I love the, the idea of, um, you know, coming out and realizing that there are so many other things be even beyond the whole you know Campbell's hero's journey uh, thing to, to look at and to to uh, tell the stories and build on them from other cultures as well um, yeah, and uh, yeah if I could just add to that I think part of it is also um, there, there are many ways of looking um, at it but one of the the things that resonates with me a lot is actually just um, enriching the the, the the genre so in my opinion if all of the fantasy stories are essentially inspired by kind of i guess well, like uh, anglo slash anglo germanic um uh, mythology it gets very uh, incestuous for a lack of a better word and i feel like by bringing various aspects of of different mythologies and then not just even just across Africa. I've seen some really, really cool things uh, on like Hindu mythology and uh, Indonesian mythology, um, both from a visual and storytelling perspective. I feel like it just enriches the genre and makes it more fun for for all of us who who love the the fantasy genre. Absolutely. Yeah. Not only is it wonderful for people who are, um, you know, from different cultures to see themselves within stories, but I think that there is a lot to be said about just trying to make other cultures accessible to everybody. Um, you know, I think it just kind of creates a bond when we can all kind of feel like we have a little piece of each other's stories. Um, I, if we, if you don't mind, if I shift gears a little bit, I'm curious. Um, you know, we did kind of briefly talk about COVID a little bit when um, you first came on and. Um, you know, we've been talking with all of our guests, uh, you know, how have you, you said you mentioned uh, com, uh, or going to a con and stuff, you know, being um, from the comic book side of things, did you do a lot of cons and kind of like, how has that changed for you uh, during COVID? And... 
Oh yeah, I, I'm about to make a, a, a confession. So I, I did a lot of, of cons, probably like 20, 25 a year. And so I'm not gonna lie, I this this is a welcome break, uh, even though it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't that, uh, that we planned on. Um, but yeah, we, we used to do a lot of uh, Europe uh, cons in, in Europe. Uh, we we're actually about to do our first couple of American cons um, this year before you know everything kicked off with with, with COVID. So um, whilst you know a bit of a break was was sort of nice, I, I do miss being able to interact with fans um, directly. It was also an opportunity to sort of spread the word with what we're doing. So that's definitely been. A, a lost or missed opportunity for us. Yeah, yeah. That, that is sad. Is we, we we could have we could have done this in person. Um, the uh, one of the things that we have been asking all of our guests uh, is just different ways that they've been you know coping on their own. That we we call it the lightning round, uh, just to find out you know what are, what are you, what is your you know comfort mechanisms and things like that. So. Uh, um, these, these are going to seem like they're probably weird questions that have nothing to do with uh, Nani or, or the industry, but it's more just about, you know, getting to know you. Um, if I if I was to say, hey, uh, Ziki, can I get you something to drink? What would you like to drink? Ooh. Your beverage of choice. It can be alcohol or non-alcoholic. Yeah, <laughs> in, anything you like. Okay. Uh, recently, I had this, um, I went to this... Uh, I guess a South American bar, and they made this cocktail that was uh, sort of a pina colada with a, a twist. So I'll just stick with pina colada because I can't remember exactly what they put in there. <laughs> That's definitely the like most exciting drink we've heard in a while. I swear, <laughs> the last ten guests have been like, "Can you just pour me a glass of bourbon?" <laughs> Which hey, we love exciting. bourbon at World Builders, but a pina colada. That spices it up. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Whiskey was going to be my second choice, but uh... there you go. You're still you're still welcome to have whiskey here. <laughs> cool. I might take care of that. And uh, and if I said, hey, let's let's uh, step out for a bite to eat. Uh, what kind of a cuisine would you enjoy? Hmm. I honestly, it would have to be Nigerian cuisine. It's it's so weird because growing up there, it's what you're fed all the time, so you don't see it as special. But having spent like 13, 14 years in, in England now, uh, I just realized how much I love it. Every time my mom comes over to visit me, I'm like, okay, um, I'm, I'm coming there to raid, raid the fridge every time my dad comes, my aunt, my uncle. So, yeah. Nigerian Is there a specific food. Nigerian uh, dish that you can name? Oh, yeah. Um, so. Okay, I'll go with my, my three favorites because okay. there, there's so many. Um, so there's something called moi moi, which is essentially uh, black eyed uh, peas or black eyed beans. You you mash them, um, you put them in a banana leaf, and then you steam them, and, and then you put like a mix of spices. It's really, really delicious. Um, then the most popular one, which is popular for a reason, is called uh, jollof rice. Technically, oh, it's, yeah. it, it originates in, um, in uh, I want to say Gambia, but it was perfected in, in Nigeria. Um, <laughs> although my Ghanaian friends might, might have something to say <laughs> about that. <laughs> um, and then the last one would probably be uh, um, suya, which is, is, is essentially just a seasoned meat um, grilled from the north of Nigeria. Um, it's grilled, it's fire grilled um, over the course of uh, a long period. It's seasoned for like a really long time and then you grill it and it's, it's really delicious. Nice. Now I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so uh, um, I'm uh, I'm about to uh, I'm about to go. I was going to say I'm about to go on a long flight, but we don't do that anymore. Um, well, we'll pretend like I'm going to go on a long flight, and I want to make sure I don't touch my face. So I'm looking for a good book to read, uh, and it could be you know graphic novel. Like that what, what would you recommend I, I grab? I'm out of stuff to read, Ziki. What could I what could I grab? Okay. So, so, so many uh, good, good choices. Uh, so I recently finished reading uh, Lucifer uh, by, uh, it's published by Vertigo. Uh, well, I, 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 I can't remember the, the name of the person that, that wrote it. It was initially introduced by uh, Neil Gaiman, but then someone else picked up um, that series. And it is really, 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 really good. I, I really uh, enjoyed 
that series. But because it's a graphic novel, um, it might not last you the entire flight. So I'll send a second graphic novel. Um, um, I'm not, I'm not going to say Nani because that's that's biased. Um, but I'll read it by I, then, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Kaya and Abini, um, which well, we published um, at Kugali. So it's a sci-fi comic inspired, but all of the visuals are inspired by um, African uh, cultures. So the, the, the creator is from Senegal. And growing up there, he, he noticed that like the tech there is like sort of really um, sort of secondhand and, and and sort of pieced up and local. So he created a futuristic world that, that that mirrored this. And visually, it is probably the most striking comic book I, I can think of. Definitely my top five. So those would be what two. What was the um, name of that again? Uh, Kayin and Abeni. So K A Y I N and A B E N I. Well, now I have something to I know what I'm going to be for. looking for tonight. I was tonight. just going to say, <laughs> we're, we're both writing it down. In the, if well, that's been great. Here's the time now. Um, well, our last, I, our, uh, one of our things we always ask too is, what is a show? If, you, if you've been watching any like Netflix or Hulu or show or old TV shows, is there anything on there that you'd recommend? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm trying to think because I haven't watched a significant amount of television this year um the last thing that i watched was uh legion um which was i think was an fx um i really like the first um uh, two seasons because it really breaks the boundary in terms of, of of storytelling because you know storytelling is oftentimes this kind of like linear sequence of events i know some stories implement uh, flashbacks but they really just uh, push the envelope in terms of like, you don't know what's real, you don't know what's fake. Um, and and the, the, it's, it's really, really hard to describe, but it's, it's such a, uh, a, like an incredible experience um, just, just uh, watching all of that. Um, and then, yeah, I think I'll just leave it with that, to be honest. Yeah, I, I have to agree that that one is one where you have to sort of sit back and just trust that the writer's going to take you somewhere eventually that will make some kind of sense because it's definitely uh, definitely not there. Yeah, I love that, that kind of storytelling. Um, that is awesome. Okay, the, the last lightning question. Um, oh, I'm, sorry, I'm going to add one more, actually. Um, oh. Uh, yeah. just oh. came to me now. Um, so Kiriku and the uh, Sorceress, if you want to see, like, a really authentic... Uh, African, uh, uh, African inspired, well, West African inspired fantasy. Kirikura and the Sorceress is, 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 you know, we're talking about bringing something completely new and different to the table. Uh, Kirikura and the Sorceress is, it like typifies that. It, it came out, it was made in the 90s um, in, mm -hmm. in, in, in France, um, but I think it's still available to uh, today um, on, a, on a couple of streaming uh, platforms. But I yeah, watched it's that on piece. Prime. Oh yeah, brilliant. Um, so I watched that recently, and it, it's uh, it's crazy. <laughs> nice. Um, the uh, the last one, and I'm I'm gonna actually put a spin on it. Um, so let's say that uh, any anybody, I I have a magic wand, and then if I wave that magic wand, anybody at all from any character alive or dead or whatever. Um, can do a wants to do a crossover with you with one with your your comic. Um, who who would you love to work with, and what characters would you like to bring into your comic and do a crossover with? It can be <laughs> anybody at all. Oh my god, this is such a hard one. Um, off the top of my head, I would probably have to go with uh, Kenta Ramura. Uh, he's the author and creator of a of a manga called Berserk, which has been running since the nineties. <laughs> and in my opinion. Berserk is sort of like I find like they're good artists, they're good storytellers, they're people who are kind of good at both. But Berserk is really, really good in, in both areas. Like as far as art is concerned, I don't know many mangas that have better artwork. And the opportunity to have like a story that I um, or or him and I collaborate on with his artwork. That would be like literally. I, I'd be like, okay, I could die happy at this stage. So it has to be Aramura. <laughs> All right, and the best part about this is that now everybody has like something new that they can uh, go off and or or something old that they can go back to. Um, it's always fun to, to learn new things. I'm I'm looking at this, looking at the berserk uh, thing, going, wow, yeah, that does look definitely my kind of thing. Hmm. Yeah. 
A uh, quick warning, it's really, really dark, so it's not for the light-hearted. Um, if you think Game of Thrones is bad, like, Berserk is... is <laughs> gotcha. Um, so where where can people um, take... I mean, we talked about Kugali.com, and I know that uh, Twitter and Instagram Facebook has Kugali Media. What What is your uh, social media, if, people, if you don't mind sharing it, <laughs> where people can find you? Uh, yeah, sure. I, um, so my social media handle is at... N K Krula, so N K R U L A, um, and uh, I usually I'm so outside of, of what I do with with Kugali, um, I do a lot of um, martial arts and I also make music as well. So that's typically what I, I, I post on my, my Instagram. Although I do post some of the stuff I do with with Kugali, but if people are interested in, in music or martial arts, they, they might enjoy my Instagram. So that's it. Excellent. Wow, now I, now I want to start the conversation over and start talking about martial arts and, and music. So, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, what we'll say that for round two. <laughs> All right, um, we're kind of reaching the end of our time here. Uh, that Our conversation was a little bit all over the place, and that's because I had so many questions, and I just, they kept popping up. But um, thank you for joining us. Uh, again, Nani is, uh, is it, it's Nani. I'm sorry. The pronunciation, I'm, I keep trying to get it, um, but yeah, it's amazing. Um, you guys check it out. Uh, Ziki Nelson, thank you for coming on. Hopefully, you know, we'll see you again in the future. Um, yeah. Yeah, we uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. had a lot of fun uh, kicking out. So thank you guys as well for having me. It has been a real pleasure. We, we have a weird kind of closing uh, ritual that we do here uh, where we say as, uh, our own magic word, um, and then wait for the chat to show it so we know that we're actually offline. So um, here comes the magic word, Vivamus. 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 Latin. Okay. Yeah. It's a, uh, although it's, it's gotten, there it is. There it is. All the Vivamus. All right, we see it. 